Welcome, and of course, the bracha. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotav, Tzivanu Asok B'divrei Torah. Amen. All right, let's go to the share screen. second here. Uh, give me a moment. I'm sorry. I have to try and figure this out. There we go. Maybe bring your microphone closer to your mouth. You can do that. How's that? Awesome. Is that more better? Much more better. Okay. So here we go. We are talking about the Ola sacrifice. Uh, the Torah is dividing, first of all, the way the Vayikra is structured here is we start off with the, um, with, in a sense, the personal offerings. Uh, and as opposed to the public offerings, we're talking about the Ola, we're talking about that particular kind of offering. We're talking also about the kinds of um, things that can be sacrificed in, in performing in Ola. And we're starting off with cattle and then the flock, and then we'll go to birds, and then we'll go to actually grain. But for the time being, we are still focused on, on, the, um, on the calf, uh, which is, I believe, what we're talking about here. Uh, I believe that generally speaking, they were not older animals that were sacrificed. They were, they were young ones. So maybe up to three years, maybe, I may be wrong. There are just so many details to remember. The shachat et, and you can see this is tons of Torah Tamima there. Ben habakar, right? The male uh, cattle, Lifnei Hashem, Bakar is singular, cattle is plural, so I, the, the calf, maybe, right, the male calf, Lifnei Hashem, before, before Hashem, Vehikrivu Vnei Aharon HaKohanim, and the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall bring it close, offer it up, et hadam, the blood, Vezaku et hadam al mizbeach saviv, and they shall literally it means they'll throw, they'll cast the blood around the altar. There's a lot of stuff that's actually being said here, uh, but we'll keep going just to finish up the sentence. Asher petach ohem oed, which is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So I'm going to let Rashi speak here, and we'll go back to you can see there's plenty of Rashi on this. So, right here, v'shachat, he shall slaughter in habakar, right? V'hikrivu hakohen, hakohanim, and the uh, the kohanim shall offer it up. So there were various stages. So the level of um, how much this is sort of. Uh, worked through and the detail that's that's worked through on all this is significant and so the actual act itself then is sort of broken into details so there is the we know that the the animal has to be pure we know that the person has to lean on the animal and then we talk about the animal then being slaughtered then this kabbalat hadam there is the uh, receiving of the blood from that slaughtering into the into a basin and then there's the moving of the basin to the altar and then there's the casting of the blood onto the altar itself and each one of these steps is delineated and um, uh, deconstructed and so that it's that it's done in as deliberate a, a way in which it can be done in as thoughtful a way as it can be done but what is interesting here is he says and this is the this is the the way uh, the tradition goes mi kabbalah va'elach he says based on the words of these of this verse looking at it very carefully he says from the receiving and onwards and when he says from the receiving he's talking about the moment when after the animal has been slaughtered that the blood is placed into a bowl 
right into a, brought into a receptacle. So he says from from that point on, mitzvat kuna, it is only priests. It's a mitzvah commandment for the priest. Limid uh, al hashchita. So we he t it teaches you that regarding the shchita, that is the actual slaughtering of the animal, shikshera bazar, that it is kasher, that it's okay to be done by a czar. A czar literally means a stranger, but here it means a non kohen. So you have to understand that essentially everything had to be really done by priests, and we had to be very careful about what was done by priests kohanim as opposed to non-priests by is regular israelites or or even non-israelites for that matter um but the, it's interesting that when it comes to the shita that does not have to be done um again there's a lot of psychology going on here and i'm sure that even as you're listening to this i mean there are all kinds of feelings quite possibly going through you so Lifne Hashem before Hashem. So, what is the purpose of that word? Ba'azara, that it has to take place in the courtyard. It cannot take place. This this offering cannot take place outside of the courtyard. It has to be there. Vehikrivu. So they shall present. Zu Kabbalah. Right. So he says this hikrivu. They should offer it up. They should present. First of all, it's Kabbalah. He says it actually refers to the receiving of the blood, okay? Shehi harishona, because that's the very first stage. Umashma'a lashon holcha, and the implication, uh, or its implication perhaps, mashma'a lashon holcha, that there's an implication of bringing or taking, l'holich, to, to take. Lamadu, so so that that's also remember there was from the moment when the animal was slaughtered and the blood was received, you then had to take it over to the altar. She Lamadnu Shtehem. So we learn both these stages. Rashi's assuming that we have some basic knowledge of the of this process. So anyway, there are other manuscripts, Svarim Acherim, Sheshtehem, Sheshtehem. So here it's just Shtehen, but there are other manuscripts that say Sheshtehen Bivne Aaron, that the two of them are through the sons of Aaron. They have to be done, in other words, descendants of Aaron have to be priests. Now, uh, so Bivne Aaron, it says uh, sons of Aaron, but point is, it doesn't say, it says B'nai Aharon HaKohanim. But we know that the sons of Aaron are priests. So what is Kohanim coming to teach us? And he says, Yachol Chalalim. If it just said descendants of Aaron, it's possible. Chalalim means profaned, right? Something that's non-kadosh, non right? Non-holy. Non, non so a halal is, in a, is, is the offspring when a priest marries someone he is forbidden to marry. So there are, in, in, um, in later on in Leviticus, we'll be told what, who a priest is permitted to marry. If he goes ahead and marries such a person anyway, uh, such a woman anyway, uh, the offspring is called a halal. And, is, and here we're saying, if it just said descendants of Aaron, well, is a halal a descendant of Aaron? And the answer is, yep, yep, there's still descendants of Aaron. Talmud lomar ha-kohanim. And for this reason, scripture says that they are kohanim, because a halal is not considered a kohen. These are very strict rules, very, very strict rules. Et hadam. So the blood, vizarku et hadam, and they shall cast the blood. So we notice hadam, hadam, ma talmud lomar dam dam shte pa'amim. What is, what is scripture trying to teach us uh, that it should, by saying blood, blood twice, by repeating the word, right? In other words, it could have just used a pronoun, didn't need to say blood explicitly. So it says, lahavi. This is to include, in other words, to tell us, et shenit arev bemino, okay, uh, or she be, be no mino. So here it's saying that if the blood is mixed 
with um, a, another sacrifice, the blood of another sacrifice, right? Whether it's, and it seems to me that Rashi is saying here, and I'm not certain, but I think this is what he's saying, that if it's a dam of an olah, right? It's another animal that was presented as an olah, and the blood of that olah somehow got mixed with the blood of this particular olah, it's okay. It's okay. She'eno mino, I think he's saying, if it's the blood of another sacrifice, I believe is what he's talking about. That if it came for where it was another type of sacrifice, not an olah, but it got mixed up with this particular blood, it's okay. Right. So he goes on to say, Yachol af bipsulim. Right. Uh, he says, does this also then come to include? I mean, just notice how how we are deconstructing so carefully, right? So he says it possibly it could include pasulim. So psulim, a pasul means that somehow the sacrifice became a non non acceptable. That's what they mean. When something is pasul, it means it can no longer be used for the mitzvah it was intended for. So something happened to the animal, they found a blemish on it, or something was done in the process. In some cases, it has to do with the thought that the priest has in mind when, he ha when he's offering the sacrifice, which would render it pasul. So he's saying, what if it it's mixed with the blood of one of those sacrifices, or or bechataot hapnimiyot, he says, or mixed with the blood of a chatat, that is a sin offering. We're going to talk about that later on in this parsha, right? Uh, again, remember the one of the most important elements of having the Beit Hamikdash or the Mishkan was to allow one to uh, offer up various kinds of offerings, reconciliation being a huge element of it, thanksgiving was another one. Um, so panimiot means the ones that were brought inside. So later on, again, we're, we're anticipating that you are familiar with this. So when it talks about sin offerings, it talks about various categories of sin offerings. So what happens, for example, if the Kohen Gadol commits a sin? That's far more serious. It has far more serious consequences than if a regular person does. What happens if the Sanhedrin commits a sin? That has far more serious consequences. What happens if a king commits a sin? Far more serious consequences. In that particular case, it affects the type of animal that's brought. It also affects what's done with the blood. And what happens is that the blood of these particular offerings are brought inside the tent of meeting or inside the shrine. Whereas if it's just a regular person, the blood is not brought inside. And that's why it's referred to, these particular offerings are referred to as chata'ot hapnimiyot, the ones that are brought inside, okay? Uh, but he goes on to say, o bechata'ot hachitzonot, okay? And he says, well, and maybe we're even talking about regular chata'ot, okay? Regular chata'ot, chitzonot means outside, chata'ot that are brought outside, she'elu lemala, uh, and he refers to, because these, the blood of these particular offerings, both the pnimiot and the chitzonot, are above. What does he mean uh, above? The he lamata and this particular blood of the Olah is below. So I need to tell you again some background. So there was a line drawn on the altar that was called Khut Hasikra. That's what it was referred to. The th the thread, the sikra thread. And certain certain offerings were presented above that, above that line, and some offerings were brought below that line. And this is also a distinction. Right, and this is Talmud Lomar Bamakom, and that's why it says scripture says the word Bamakom. Okay, uh, sorry, Bamakom Acher. It says scripture says in another place, not here, but another place, et damo, its blood, its blood, and here it's understood its blood as opposed to the blood of these offerings that were just mentioned here. Now, let me pause for a moment and say,
You either love this stuff, in other words, you either love the, 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 the process of deconstruction, because quite honestly, we're getting about as close to Talmud study as, as Rashi's going to get. And that is that the, 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 the desire and the willingness to deconstruct to, to this degree. And believe me, I think you will believe me, this is not where the dis deconstruction ends. You can keep splitting the atom, you know, uh, quite down far, okay? But we're in the process and we're in the heart of the process. And this is either drives people crazy and they don't want to know about it and it turns them off or they love it and and you kind of think wow you know that the level of depth that we're getting into is something that is has a certain type of satisfaction that is hard to describe so uh, i i understand <laughs> i understand uh for, but but at least you're having this experience and and forgive me for having to watch me struggle a little bit uh, in terms of trying to remember uh, everything that I've I've prepared and that I've done in the past, et cetera, et cetera. But this is this is just some of what it's doing. But again, when you think about reality and and experiences, you realize they are made up of little tiny molecules, let's say, of of actual happening and trying to trying to sort of wrap our heads around what is actually going on or what actually needs to go on involves this kind of thing. One more comment on this, and that is just in, uh, apropos of what I've said up to now on this particular issue, when you love something, you just can't get enough of it. I mean, you just, this is obsession. This is obsession. So that's part of love. Going on, the zarku, they shall cast, right? They shall throw. So he explains exactly how is this done. Because again, this needs to be done in a very deliberate and, and thoughtful kind of way. So he says, he describes it. Omed Lamata, he stands at basically, it would sound like the base of the altar. It's quite a large altar. The zorek min hakli, and he casts from the vessel um, whether he uses a type of spoon to cast, whether he puts his fingers in it and he casts, that's something that's a detail that will have to be uh, clarified. But anyway, he then casts it, le kotel hamizbeach, le mata mechut hasra. He casts it onto the wall of the altar below the chut hasikra. Keneged hazaviyot, and he says, at the corners, opposite the corners, and basically, I believe it's two corners. I'm I never can absolutely remember which of the two corners it is. Whether it's the northeast corner and the southwest corner, but I know that he moves towards the right. And I believe he goes up to the northeast corner and then he casts the blood on the corner there so that the blood now sprinkles on both sides, right? On the east side and on the north side. And then he proceeds to walk around the altar to the southwest side and he casts the blood there. And then it says, Ne'emar Saviv. It says, around. Sheyehe Hadam Nitan Ba'arbaruchot. He says, so that the blood is placed on all four directions, Hamizbeach, of the altar. Okay. And he says, so that's what he's supposed to do. But Rashi's gonna, this is typical again of, of, of halachic midrashic argumentation. He says, O Yaho Yakifenu Kachut. But maybe it means that he should really sort of take take it and dribble the dribble the blood around the altar like a thread. Does it mean that? Talmud Lomar, he says, for this reason, scripture uses the term Vizarku. They should cost. The E of Sharl Hakif Bizrika, and it's impossible to throw the blood, right? When you cast the blood, that that's going to surround the altar. Okay, it's not going to go all around the altar when you just throw the blood on one part. E Vizarku, okay, uh, sorry, um, E would mean E Vizarko, okay, oh, it's a 
Okay, so v'zarku they shall they shall cost yachol bezricha achat. So it says, well, possibly when it says they should call they should cost it, does it mean bezricha achat? Does it mean with just one cost? Talmud lomar saviv, and that's again why it says the word saviv. Okay, ha keitzad. How is this possible? Notan shte matanot. Shehen Arba. He places, he does two offerings, he two gifts in a sense, or two two givings, which mount amount to four. And the point is this that by by doing it in this particular way on the on the north, uh, east, and southwest corners, he has now put it on all four sides. And with just two two costs of blood. Asher Petach Ohel Moed which is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Again, we know this already because we know about how the, how the sanctuary was constructed. So what is this coming to say? It means, look, they had the altar around. It was all there, but it says it had to be at the opening of the tent of meeting, meaning, and not at a time when they had taken down the tent of meeting to move it to the next place, that it had to all be set up for this to be done. Um, would you like me to pause a moment? I don't see any hands raised, but does any, please, I, I welcome you to react and to comment. So I will, I will stop. I'm gonna put the uh, arrow here if I can. Yep, there we are. And we'll go to the next verse. Oops, sorry about that. Move too quickly, here we are. And I'm going to stop the share. Any reactions? Or are you totally blown away? So there's nothing to say. Nothing to say. I do have yeah. my hand raised. Yes, good. Okay, great. I see it, Janet. Thank Go for you. it. Okay. So my first reaction was the, the fact that they, Rashi covers all possibilities that one type of blood is automatically as pure as the other type of blood. Mm -hmm. And I remember, seem to remember that when they do sacrifices, they discuss what you, what you were commenting on. If they find a, a blemish in the process of the sacrifice, it is still a holy sacrifice, even though they missed it. You've got yeah. that look. I seem to remember that as well. I also seem to remember that it didn't necessarily mean that it was brought up onto the altar. But if, or for some reason, I think if it was up on the altar, this is my recollection, that if it was on the up on the altar already and they discovered it, they didn't take it down. Um, yeah. I could yeah. be wrong about this. Sadly, my memory is not photographic. Uh, and it, you know, I just, this is why one goes over it and over it and over it in the hopes no, that I, the, one the, will remember point, the detail. Go ahead, please. Yeah, but my point is, is that what Rashi does, and I think what the Kohen do is, is that they take the fact that the blood may have mixed, but it doesn't change the focus yes. of the blood. Right. I, I find that good. I do. It's not too, it encompasses the whole. Yeah, I mean, Again, what does that really signify? Does, you know, um, does it have some, I mean, what's, what's the real uh, valency of it? Is, it? is it trying to say that there's a great desire to make sure that as, as much on the one hand that we try and perfect it, that nevertheless, there is some, there are some levels where if it isn't exact, uh, and if, but nevertheless incorporate something else that is also a worthy effort. It's okay. Uh, the, the thing that, that I also struggle with is to try and understand, I believe that there is deep symbolism to everything that's going on here. And that if we understood the symbolism, it would be very helpful. Uh, that there are, there are many, uh, I'm gonna use the word secrets, you know, to this, um, that we just don't know. Uh, and it takes a lot of study. And, and you have to be willing, I guess, emotionally, to be open to this kind of stuff. And even though for at least in our culture, this tends to be a turnoff. Well, I think I think, though, that if you just take it general, that Hashem, mm -hmm. the blood of life is the blood of life. Yes, and if you want to take it in society, it is a 
society of differences, but it's still holy. You, you just gave me another thought too, okay? And, and I think it's an important one. And it's saying, just because this involves the blood of your sacrifice, doesn't mean that other sacrifices aren't just as worthy or just as important, et cetera, et cetera. We tend to focus on, you know, uh, it's the old major surgery, minor surgery joke, right? The difference between major surgery and minor surgery. If it's my surgery, it's major surgery. If it's your surgery, it's minor surgery. That's the definition. And I wonder if that's, I just wonder if it's coming in some ways to give that message. But I, I sort of, as I was listening to you, that's what I heard, you know what I mean? That's kind of where I, I felt you were going in a way too. Well, it so. is, it's a, it's a less deconstruction and a more gathering of the meaning of the blood. Yeah, oh, exactly. right, right. No, that's also another, another issue, yes, okay. Any more statements? Otherwise, we can stop I here. I think the uh, rabbi, the blood yes. is the life of the animal Correct. or the life of the human being. Correct. Correct. We do not drink or eat the blood. Correct. Also, fat uh, on the kidneys and the uh, right. essentially uh, the sewage. Liver, so far, we do not eat the fat either. There right. is a, um, a ritual for the fat and the blood. We we we've, we've got to be very careful on that. Yes, uh, on a on a regular animal when it's slaughtered, not for the not for sacrificial purposes, uh, these are all removed. We are not allowed to consume any of that. So, what happens then if you have a nice uh, rib steak and there's a lot of blood there? Is that forbidden? Do you have to get rid of it? The answer is no, no. We're talking about a specific. There's a distinction between dam uh, tamtsit. That's the blood from a like from a rib steak as dam hanefesh, which is a much thicker kind of blood. That is the blood that's forbidden. Okay. Uh, there's also a distinction between the fats. Okay. The fat that is forbidden, I believe, is essentially the suet. Uh, that is a very hard congealed kind of fat that's around the kidneys and the loins, uh, as opposed to the, the, the schmaltz, the chicken fat, or the fat that happens to be in your second cut brisket or stuff like that. That is not the fat that we're talking about. Again, this is all involving deconstruction. And, and you it's can also see, involving yeah. kashrut. Yes, absolutely. And that's of, why you put salt the meat. Yes, to, to, to get rid of as much blood as possible. And also change it. And soak it. it, and soak it, by the way. And yes. you change it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. And, and the idea then is to sanctify uh, our table and what we eat, to recognize that food, even though it's there essentially, um, you know, as a survival thing, that we can take something that just involves physical survival and perhaps elevate it to a level where it actually involves perhaps spiritual survival. So I'm gonna stop with that.